Hello, everybody. Um, I'm kind of going to run through a lot of um, uh, information here. Um, a lot of times I like to leave um, a decent amount of time towards the end for questions um, so that you guys um, for sure get some value out of it. Um, if you have something that is pertaining to a window that uh, I'm currently in or a subject that I'm talking about, I'll try and address those questions right away. But we can get more into the um, um, other questions where uh, something maybe I didn't cover um, at the end there. So I'll jump right into it. Um, first thing we're gonna go over is um, just some uh, different pieces on setup. Uh, so I'll be going to the inventory uh, card here. The uh, first thing I kind of want to look over is um, some of the things that um, are features that don't get used too often. Uh, so here we go. So I set up a couple new items for this. Um, and a few of the things that um, people don't use too often are like the suggest items uh, button here. Um, if you have an item set up, we can go into the suggest items and the um, we can put in items that we want to have our salespeople recommend to our customers. And this is just gonna prompt, um, uh, prompt them to uh, mention that they include this and the price. Um, so we go in here, we'll add items and whatever the quantity is. Uh, keep in mind the suggested quantity is just a um, a total. It's not going to be dependent on how many of the item that the uh, sales invoice is for. Um, so I have this install pack set up on this new inventory item. And I'm going to run into a sales transaction here and show you what you'll see as you're running, uh, creating a transaction for that. So as soon as you enter that item, this suggest sales item entry is gonna pop up. Now it gives them a little sales script which you can uh, edit so if there are some talking points or um, maybe some information that you want the uh, your salesperson to know right off the bat, we can enter that here and it's going to show up in this sales script area. So we can, we can edit how many we want to add. It shows us how many are available and the suggested quantity. Um, you might be able to have that as um, like internally that the suggested quantity is on a per unit basis. So if they're selling two you always want to add, change this to two. Um, to add them on, it's just marking that checkbox and hitting OK. And then that item gets added right onto the uh, sales order. Um, so this is going to be um, like installation kits. Um, if you get, if you sell electrical supplies like a dielectric grease, some of those um, uh, items that are kind of that you normally see at the checkout or um, that are related, but you don't. Um, they don't come to mind right away. The other one that a lot of people uh, don't do too much on is the alternate items. Um, so from the item maintenance card, if we go to the go to menu and then we go down to alternate uh, items, we can make, uh, we can list several items that are uh, possibly like an obsolete number that you still uh, still have stock on or maybe the opposite direction where you you connect your um, your new items to your old items uh, so that you can um, look at those and report on those um, one of the problems with this is it's not going to suggest that item if you are out of stock on um, uh, the connected item this is mainly going to be for reporting. Uh, so there's our uh, reporting or information. Um, so once we have that set up, there's a couple different places that um, we'll see it. So if if we're back in the sales transaction entry, um, I'll just
just back order my quantities here because I don't have any on hand. Um, and if I look at, I'm going to go to the, uh, actually that's not the best. If they don't have access to the item maintenance window, it'll bring them to the inventory item inquiry window. And that's kind of where this shines. Because if we look at that new item, right on the inquiry, it shows, uh, it, it'll list the first two substitutes for that item, um, which I just have listed as uh, my old inventory item. Um, so that's one way that we can say, hey, we don't have, uh, we don't have that on hand. Take a look, see if there's another alternate out there. See if we have any quantities for that to uh, get the customer out the door with the uh, the product, or deplete our old uh, stock. Um, the other thing that I did was I added it to a smart list. Um, this is probably um, going to be pretty handy when you're trying to eliminate some of that old stock or um, just kind of keep up with what um, what you have there. Um, we can uh, easily modify uh, smart list to add the columns of alternate item one and alternate item two so that they show up on here. So you can kind of build your own little cross-reference of uh, what items work for what items. So if I did a search and looked up my new inventory item here, I'd be able to see that my ultra, what my alternate items are. So then while we're kind of discussing the item card, there there's a few other things that I, I want to go over here. One of the features that um, I tend to push uh, quite a bit is the copy feature. Um, this is going to uh, make setting up items a lot quicker if you have very similar items. Um, so if you go in, you create your new item, just giving it a name. And as soon as you key off that uh, item number field, we can hit the copy. And from here, we just select what item that we want to use. And then we have all the options um, to actually uh, copy over. Um, Sometimes you won't want to have price list and uh, list price, but with, with these, we can always unmark them. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that it's going to pull a lot of data from the inventory class. Um, so I'll just copy this here. Um, and you'll notice that the quantity decimals is already blanked out. If you have a, um, on your item class, if you have a U of M schedule, uh, put in there, it's automatically going to set up this item with quantities and the U of M schedule. And then as soon as you hit that copy button, those are going to be locked out. Um, so if you have an item class that's going to have multiple different U of M schedules, um, we definitely want to have that um, uh, blank on the item class. Otherwise, you're going to have to just set it up completely by uh, uh, at the item. You're not going to be able to use that copy feature. Um, and just to uh, mention it, whenever you set up an item, always double check these maintain history boxes. Uh, this is going to make sure uh, you don't run into headaches down the road. Um, I, whenever I set up items, I always double check these. I'll usually just uh, create a smart list and look at these. Um, these fields are pretty easy to add on to the um, 
the basic smart list just by adding those columns and just make sure that all of them are checked as long as it is something that you're tracking quantities on. You don't necessarily need to have them checked if they're like service items, miscellaneous items where you're not tracking those quantities, but anything with quantities uh, that are being tracked, always double check that uh, maintain history uh, checkbox junk. So one of the things that, and we'll just do a quick one here, uh, in this copy window, you'll see that um, the planning attributes are also marked. Um, this is something that a lot of people, um, uh, they'll have a little bit of confusion on those. Um, I'll run into that with that item. So if we go to the go to menu and the item resource planning, those uh, planning attributes are down here with the order points and the order up to's. Um, if we edit this window with it in the default values, that's just going to set it up for the item number itself. It's not going to be specific to any site IDs. So anytime we're using the PO generator, um, it's not going to function how we want. We want to have that marked uh, on the site ID and then bring it up for the specific location that we're using. Uh, it's not set up here, so I will just add that quick. Um, so it, depending on how we're um, how we're doing our order policy, um, whether it be using the PO generator or if we just have uh, the period order quantity or fixed order quantity, um, these uh, these check boxes will be or these boxes will be either available or not available. Um, I'm just going to use the PO generator method, and then. I'm going to set this one up for 25 and 50. Um, what this, what these two values mean is that the order point is uh, the literally the uh, the point that we're going to create an order when we use the uh, PO generator. If we have 26 of them, it's not going to suggest suggest this as a purchase order. But as soon as we cross that threshold into 25 or 24, um, it's going to uh, generate on that purchase order generator saying that, hey, I'm at my order point. Here's how many I want to order. And that's going to be based on the order up to level. Um, so here, if we were at, say, 24, it would, um, depending on um, some other settings, which if we're using the PO generator, we uh, it's going to look at the vendor. So I'm going to hop over to that here quick. And we'll just add that. So here we have um, some other values that'll, that'll come into play here. Um, so it's going to try and order 25, but it will also look at here at what my order multiple is. So if that is, say, 10, it's going to, uh, I believe it would order uh, 20 of them because it's not going to go over that order up to level. Um, but say if that was, we were down to 20, it would order 30. So it's going to look at here and then it's going to uh, see that it's ready to order. And then it's going to look at this order multiple if we're uh, if this is our primary vendor. Um, the when you're using the PO generator, uh, let's see, I'll pop this open. We do have a couple of different methods here um, for the replenishment level. Um, we can use the order point quantity or the order up to level. Um, so anytime we're below that order up Eventually, it would go um, that high. And then the ven vendor EOQ. So that's going to be the economic order quantity. So if that vendor say they're going to give you a better deal when you order 100, that's going to be um, that's going to be the recommended quantity if we're using that as the replenishment method. Um, uh, sometimes vendors will have those bulk discounts, so it, it's 
you can set this up on a per item basis and it's definitely something that you might want to keep in mind. Um, as far as the vendor selections go, we have a couple different options. Um, we can have it, and th these are just going to be the defaults. Um, you can have the primary uh, uh, primary vendor, but if it's um, more, more often than not, it'll be primary vendor, but sometimes people do vendor with lowest cost. Um, but you got to keep in mind that um, with that, unless you're up manually updating the uh, costs on that on each vendor item relationship those are those are going to fall um, uh, become outdated pretty quick because you're not actually uh, updating that uh, who has the lowest cost it's just going to keep updating the one where you're actually ordering it from um, so potentially if you if you're reaching out to several vendors and get the lowest uh, lowest price it might be best just to pop that information into that uh, into that vendor item relationship so that you when you do this it looks at that Next thing I'm going to touch base on is U of M schedules. Um, these can kind of be tricky to um, to people that aren't used to uh, how GP handles them. Um, we have uh, quite uh, quite a few different options here. Um, whenever we're at creating a um, item, we always want to set it up so that the U of M schedule fits for that item. Um, a lot of people will just do eaches um, as a uh, non-decimal point. Um, it's just a whole, um, you're always settling it as a whole, you're bringing it in as a whole. Um, and then from that point on, they'll build, um, here, let's see that, bring up that. Um, you'll build up from there. So you can add like a case where it's um, gonna have a certain amount of eaches in there and you'll kind of, um, make it so that the uh, uh, transaction entry is easiest. So when you're ordering from your vendor, if your vendor only sells it in those cases, you can put in the, on your purchase order that you're getting five cases, and that's going to automatically bring in, uh, in this case, it'd be 50, um, 50 eaches. Um, GP is going to be tracking your inventory in that base unit of measure, it won't be tracking uh, behind the scenes, I should say. It's not going to be saying, looking at, hey, you brought in five cases at this cost. It's going to say you brought in 50 eaches at this cost. Um, you're still going to have that uh, item history on your purchase order um, and your receipt and all that. Um, but behind the scenes, it's tracking on that base U, to U of M. Um, like mentioned, most people will use whole numbers for each is, um, then you'll get into like feet or um, uh, maybe gallons or something like that where you're breaking into um, decimal places. Um, I have had uh, customers really want to use decimal places with each is, and one of the ways that we, uh, we can get around uh, some of the shortfalls of that uh, by making a um, a different schedule that uses an each as the whole and then for, for in this instance I have half and quarter uh, I have there um, have it built out here and when you are building these um, your first line is always going to be your base U of M and it's gonna just be the equivalent to uh, itself then after that you start building it out from um, there saying that a U of M of half is equal to 0.5 inches. Uh, U of M of quarter is equal to 0.25 inches. Um, you have to call out those individually before you can link to uh, link to each other. So if I wanted, I could do So we'll hit it. 
Now, this isn't going to provide you with much more information that's not already there, but you can make those equivalencies if, um, say, in a soda example, uh, two six packs equal a case of soda. Um, so you can make those equivalencies. Uh, they're they're not going to really do you. Um, uh, they're not going to be all that beneficial because it's mainly going to be what the U of M is and how that relates to the uh, base U of M. The problem with going with eaches and having decimal places is that the end uh, end users more often than not will type in one, and with how GP works, that one always goes into the far farthest to the right place. So if I type in one when it's uh, an item that tracks quantities uh, to two decimal places, it's going to be 0 0.01. Um, that's how a lot of times we'll get cost layers that are messed up. Um, we'll get um, your quantities start uh, becoming off. And then it, it, the farther along it goes, the, wor the, the bigger the headache that it becomes. Um, one of the ways to get around this is on the um, on the U of M schedule, it, or uh, on the item, I should say. Um, so if we go to the price list for this item that I set up um, having the half quarter in uh, each, um, we can go into the options window in this item price list maintenance window. If we go to options, we do have the selling options here. What with these options, we can either set it so that we won't sell halves, or um, we can just sell whole numbers or whole and fractional. So a lot of times, if we are um, working with these items that aren't necessarily, um, uh, we don't want them to be decimals necessarily, but we want to be able to sell part of something. Um, we'll break it down to like a half and then quarter and that, but we're only going to deal with selling them as holes. So this is going to be a uh, a whole half, uh, which just means that when I sell it, it's going to remove 0.5 um, eaches out of my system. But I'm not going to be able to say, you know, instead of if I want to sell a quarter, I'm not going to be able to say I want to sell 0.5 halves. Um, it's going to prevent that and only let me use whole numbers. Uh, but it, on the back end, it's going to continue um, removing those uh, removing those items from the system at the correct rate. Uh, then remember correctly. Um, so we have the same. Uh, we kind of have the same thing on the purchasing side. Um, so we have our default purchasing U of M, um, and we'll just throw that in there. But then we have that same, um, those same options. So if if it's not something that I want to allow my uh, end users to be able to order either quarter or half, and I only want them to order eaches, I can also set that as whole. So with it set up like this, the only way that we're going to get um, out of sync with uh, our quantities being like having that 0.01 is with inventory adjustments. Uh, GP is not going to have a way that we can prevent that, uh, but we can definitely handle it on the purchasing side and the sales side. So that that only leaves that uh, up that one window where we can get those quantities, um, those incorrectly entered quantities. Um, and if we make sure that our um, the people entering those transactions are pretty diligent about double checking their decimal pl places, this is one of those ways that we can get into those more unique uh, U of M schedules so that we can have those halves, have those half gallons, things like that. Um, it's not something we usually um, um, usually push for. Uh, but it is an option if we do have one of those items that we just need to have decimal places, but nine times out of ten, we're, we want them to be eaches. Let's 
screen. Next, I'm going to jump over to kind of explain a little bit on kits versus assemblies. Um, so with kit items in GP, uh, we are not tracking our um, We're not tracking the quantity on the kit itself. Um, we only track the quantity on the components. So when you set up a kit, it's just going to be this item type and changing that to kit. By doing that, uh, we're not going to be tracking our um, our quantities for this kit. It's just an easy way to bundle a uh, group of items together and sell them. The biggest issue with them is we don't have, um, it, it's not a quick and easy thing to say, hey, I have five of these kits that I can sell. You'll have to look at the individual components to determine how many of those kits you can build still. Um, once you have that kit set up, and I will just do a quick here. Uh, setting up that item, we're just going to um, add whatever components fit into that. And we can set up multiple quantities. Um, we can set up uh, more or less the recipe to build that kit. Um, but like I said, we don't have the visibility of how many I can uh, create at this time. Um, another option that we have is to use assemblies. With assemblies, we are, um, let me get to the bill of materials here. Um, we're, we're kind of doing it as uh, same thing as a kit, but what, what we can do this way is we can track our um, how many of those kits we have on hand if we're pre-assembling them. Um, this way we can oh, we can say, hey, I always want to have um, five of these kits on hand. Um, set up a smart list with a reminder for any time we go below that, uh, set it up as an order point or something like that. Anytime we go below that, we go and set those items up. And then with those, um, we can set up uh, how many are in there, and then this will, um, we can track uh, the obsolete items and uh, whether they're active. Um, so we can kind of have these be a fluid setup if there ends up being items that you, um, items that you're replacing on there. Um, for whatever reason that, that is. And let's see. And then as far as creating those, we just go into the assembly entry. And then with this assembled quantity, that's just how, my, how many you're making. Change that. Uh, not released. Usually I do it in that order. Um, and then once it builds it, from there we can just post. And I think the uh, the biggest thing with um, assemblies versus kits, um, besides the um, being able to have visibility of how many of those assemblies or kits that you have done, um, is the ability to roll in um, additional costs besides the um, 
besides the components. With um, with the bill of materials uh, assemblies, we can create a miscellaneous item uh, that has a cost associated with it so that we can kind of add in labor or um, uh, any other, other additional costs I want to roll into that um, item so that, that that finished assembly has a different cost than just purely what the components are. Um, so that's definitely one of the um, added features to that. Um, I'll roll right into the um, serial numbers and lot, tr uh, lot since um, kind of brought it up there. Uh, let's see. So a lot of times we I get questions on how do I find out what happened with a serial number. Um, I always use the serial lot trace inquiry window. Um, when you go into this window initially, uh, this first drop down is just the it says I need to, and then look here for what is um, what you're looking for. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory, um, so I'm just going to do find all transactions for a serial number. Um, type in your item number uh, of that uh, that we need to find out. And then we have two options. We can either enter the specific serial number that we want to use, or if it's something that you know that there's not that many of those serial numbers out there, we can use the serial lot dropdown. And it's not there. Uh, let's see. Share eight four. That's what I did wrong. So if we if we know the serial number, we can populate it there, and it's going to populate all the history down here. Um, so you can see that with this item, um, it came in via an adjustment, um, inventory adjustment, uh, where it went to went to the warehouse. Then it, there was a transfer going from the warehouse to my north site, and then I had a sales transaction entry. Um, you can see when they're, po it'll tell you when they're posted or unposted. Uh, let's see if I go back here, hit redisplay. Okay, yep. Um, so if I don't populate these two fields, I can use this serial lot dropdown to show me all of the um, serial numbers that I have in the system. Um, so with this item, I can see that also brought into warehouse through an adjustment and transferred to the north, but that one's still in the system. Um, uh, one thing um, I do get a few questions on is when people see this reconcile uh, as a serial or lot number, um, that just means that when you reconciled your uh, that item, GP found that you should have, um, that you have more on hand, but you don't have the um, the lot number or serial number history to match up with what your on hand quantity is. Um, so it will just put those in there as uh, with the serial number, or lot number called reconcile and then a number. Um, that way they kind of stand out that hey, we, we can either go in and fix this or we can sell it how it is. More often than not, people will use that, use that as kind of a um, indicator that I need to figure out what's going on with these quantities. Uh, from there, go in, remove that item, then add back the correct serial number or add uh, quantities to uh, the correct lot. That way we're... Um, Kind of making sure that everything it's another just a flag to say hey something's wrong with this um and let's take a look um, most of the time with items that are serial tracked or lot tracked uh we want to be pretty diligent with those um those quantities so anytime we see those serial uh those reconcile uh lots or serials um just a red flag let's take a look maybe maybe this won't be the only issue issue we find it's just a good idea to keep on top of those Okay. 
The last thing I have here is, uh, actually let's do two things. Um, with site IDs, um, there's a couple, uh, couple things that I wanna go over. So when you're setting up a new site ID, um, We have the option of assigning, um, doing a mass assign, um, which is going to prevent uh, users from having to click that, uh, build that item site relationship every single time they go in there. Um, to do that, once we've created our um, site, if we click on the assign, oh, gotta save it. Uh, assign button, it's going to go to this item site assignments window. And from here, we can set up kind of a um, uh, restriction list so that we're only bringing over what we want. Um, so it might be something that we have a couple different classes that we want want to uh, bring over. Uh, might not want to bring every single thing on in our inventory over. Um, so we might need to run this a couple different times, um, but we can do, uh, we have a few different options for ranges. Um, then once we've selected them, if we hit okay, it's gonna go through and bring in everything in that range restriction that we set up, and it's gonna create those item site relationships. So if we wanna prevent, um, you know, our salespeople or our purchasing people from going into those item site relationships and building them, we'll want to go ahead and once we've created that site, go in and add all those items. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to touch base with on sites is when you need to delete a site. Um, there's a handful of uh, things that you need to um, kind of check off when you uh, want to delete the site. The um, first and foremost, you can't have any quantities of any items at that site. Um, once we're past that, then you want to make sure that you don't have any unposted um, uh, purchase order documents, such as receipts or invoices, um, any open POs, um, or any sales orders or invoices that are unposted. Once we have all those transactions posted um, or canceled or deleted or however we handle them, um, the next uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to um, get rid of all of the item site relationships. Which if we go to inventory and quantity sites. So if we go in here and click assigned and site ID, I've only have it assigned to this one, I, uh, one site right now, but we would need to delete this record in order to be able to delete this, uh, the warehouse site. And that is, that's going to be one of the more time consuming things um, is getting rid of those item site relationships. Um, a lot of times in, uh, once we have all the transactions taken care of and all the quantities taken care of, uh, we'll run a SQL script to get rid of these relationships. Um, but the big thing is getting, um, getting all of those um, quantities and transactions taken care of so that they're no longer there. Um, one of the things we can do is we can mark this inactive box for this item number and site combination. Um, so if we mark it there, it doesn't make it for all this item, uh, everything for this item. Um, like we can do north at that. So when we look at this, we can see that north is active here 
the warehouse is inactive. Uh, that's one way to kind of prevent transactions from occurring there. Um, the other thing we can do is go into the site itself. And this also has an inactive box. Um, so we can kind of start filtering things out from being uh, brought into that, that site. Some people will just inactivate the site and not worry about deleting them. Um, that's another option. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch base on was uh, multi-bins versus uh, the default bins. When we go to an item and we see this, uh, let me go to new item. This this bin field, um, for the most part, is just informational. Um, it's going to give us um, just the normal place that we keep uh, keep that item. Um, once we get once we start using multi bin, that default bin doesn't um, doesn't really mean much. Um, at that point, we're going to be looking at um, this as what our default bins for specific transactions are, and then the priority of those bins. Um, so, and that's when we're gonna start tracking quantities on, that are in specific bins. If we're, if we're not using the multi-bin, that bin field is purely informational. We can add, we can add it to various reports, um, but there's not gonna be anything as far as GP functionality. Uh, that's going to track any quantities in there or recommend it to the um, whoever's doing the purchasing receipt um, unless we add it to that report. Uh, and that uh, looks like that is everything I had set out that I wanted to cover. Um, so we do have some time for uh, questions if anybody has any. If you have any questions, feel free to um, write them in that question panel right there. I haven't seen any come in so far, but that was a lot of great information, Scott. I thought that was very good uh, cover of inventory and GP. As we wait a couple more minutes to see if any questions come in, I do want to mention that we have several upcoming events and webinars for GP within September here, the upcoming month. Um, there's one next week on SalesPad Desktop, um, maximizing the impact of dynamic CRM, features in GP that you should be using but aren't. And then on September 25th, we are having an official Fargo office ribbon cutting at Open House. So if you're in the area, we'd love for you to join us. And then at the end of the month, uh, another webinar on optimizing management reporter. And all of these events and webinars are free for you to attend as a Stonebridge client. And you can register online at our website. I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So Scott, unless you have anything else to add, we can wrap up. And if you guys have any follow-up questions you think of later, you can feel free to give us a call or send us an email and Scott will be happy to help you out. All right, thanks so much, okay. Scott. All right, thanks for your time, everybody.